Good morning. We're going to go ahead and, and get started uh, and just jump right in. Uh, I'm so glad that you guys are here this morning. Um, if you got the email, obviously you did because you're here. Uh, we'll be spending four weeks together the month of February leading it up to the week of marriage retreat in here. Uh, just, just I want you to, to sort of hear from me at the beginning uh, of my time as your senior pastor and to, I want you to hear my heart. Uh, largely, I want us to, uh, to, to be uh, focused on the right things and heading in the right direction and, and on the same page. Uh, I hope that most of what I'll say in this four weeks, uh, I hope that most of it will not be news to any of you, uh, but that it, it will be a good reminder uh, for you. I want to, if you will, turn your Bible with me to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to begin just by reading this passage, and then I, I want to pray for us, uh, and then sort of set the scene of where I hope to go in the next four weeks, uh, and what, what I hope to, uh, to talk about as, as we spend this time together, uh, and then jump in uh, for today. There are a lot of passages we could go to in, in the New Testament, and particularly in Paul's writings, uh, about what it means to be together as the body of Christ, what it means to be united uh, together in the church. Uh, maybe one of my favorite is the one I want to read to you now, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 1. We'll read through verse 16. It is, a, I think, a really beautiful picture of the church united together uh, for the sake of the gospel. Paul writes, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, I therefore... A prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, or worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, but by, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather... Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our time. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true, and that it is good for us. And Father, we pray that you would continue the work that you have done at Bakran in the coming years. We pray that you would knit us together into one body, that we may grow up into maturity, that we may grow into the likeness of Christ. I thank you for the gifts that you have given to this body. Varied as they are uh, given to each member who holds the Spirit, Father, we thank you for the ways you have gifted this body, and we pray that you would use our gifts Empower us by the Spirit that we might proclaim the goodness of the Lord Jesus to his glory. Father, we thank you that you know what we need before we ask it. Father, you know what is coming in the next year and five years and ten years, even when we may not. And so we entrust all that we have to you. And we pray that you would make us faithful, even as you are faithful. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. One of the reasons I wanted to, to sort of take this time to put us all in the same room together uh, and to, to go through this is it's just, it's important in seasons of transition to just be reminded of what matters. What are we doing here? What, what are we focused on? What are our goals? Who are we? And that's really why this class is called Who Are We? It's, it's a reminder of, of who we are. I think about every year, uh, normally either towards the end of the year or right at the beginning of the year, Hannah and I try to get away for a day. 
uh, and do what we call, we've been calling for years now, our State of the Union. Uh, where we send the kids with somebody else. Seth watched uh, our kids this week or this year, and I think McCammon's watched the other half of our kids. And we get away, uh, and we get a whiteboard because every good meeting needs a whiteboard. Uh, it's so great. We, and we go over all the things in our, we talk about our budget, we talk about goals for the year, we talk about our calendar, we talk about the things that are going well and the things that we want to change. And we, we spend just time praying together through these things, thinking together through these things. And, and uh, often what we talk about in those meetings aren't new things. It's just a reminder of our goals, a reminder of what, what are we prioritizing in our life and in our family, uh, in our own spiritual lives, in the lives of our children, and how are we shepherding them towards Christ? Are there things we're doing that we're, we, don't, we need to stop doing? Are there things that we're not doing that we need to do? And it's, it has in our marriage been uh, maybe the single most fruitful thing we do uh, is just to have some time away, uh, to have this state of the union, and to be reminded uh, of our goals and who we are and to be uh, committed together. Uh, and it has been really fruitful. So I want you to think about the next four weeks kind of as uh, our state of the union, right? It, it is a time for us to, to not set necessarily new goals. Again, I don't think most of what I'll say to you is not new. Uh, it, it is the same as it's always been, uh, but it's good for us to be reminded who we are, where have we been, where are we right now, and, and where are we going? That's, that's my goal uh, in these, these next four weeks. So today, uh, what we'll talk about largely is what we believe. Uh, just we'll walk through a little bit of the history of Buck Run. Uh, those of you who have been Dis- Discover Buck Run, a lot of this will be familiar to you. Uh, if you've not been Discover Buck Run, congratulations, you are now in Discover Buck Run. Uh, this is uh, a lot of the same material we, we, we cover there. Uh, what we have found is that even folks sometimes who have been at Buck Run for years that there's a lot of information that we, we teach to new believers that they don't know. Uh, new members coming in sometimes know more about who we are and what we do than folks who have been here for 20 years. Uh, and so I want us all to be on the same page. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the history of Buckron. How did we get from 1818 to right now? Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about just some basic beliefs. What, what do we think about the gospel? And then we'll run through uh, a very Cliff Notes version of, of basic Christian uh, doctrine. Next week... Uh, we'll talk about what we're made of, who makes up Buck Run. Uh, we'll walk through each of our pastors. Uh, I think it's helpful for everybody to know who, who are all of our pastors and staff and what do they do, right? Admit it, there are people on our staff that you love dearly, but you have no clue what they do, right? So it's useful for us to say, here, here are your pastors and here are their roles and responsibilities. Here are your staff. Here are your deacons, right? What do we expect of our deacons? Who are our deacons? What do they do? How do our deacons serve the body? You need to know that. Uh, and then we'll talk about membership. For us as members, what is it that is expected of us? What are our membership expectations? What does it mean to be a member of Buck Run? So we'll do that next week. So we talk about sort of who makes up Buck Run. And then weeks three and four, uh, we'll talk about what we do. So we'll talk about all the core ministries of Buck Run. Uh, uh, both Kevin and Will will spend, I, I gave them five minutes. We'll see if they stay within their time. Uh, just quick overviews of what kids' ministry looks like and what student ministry looks like. And we'll talk through adult discipleship and community groups and the core men. What is it that we do? What are the core pieces? What are all the cogs that fit together? And then in the last week, uh, we'll, we'll talk about our missions partners, uh, our mission trips, uh, local partners. We'll talk about our budget. We'll talk about all the, the pieces uh, that, that sort of round out what is it that we do as a church? How do we uh, love the Lord and love each other and and serve in ministry. So there's the sort of map of where we're going. I want to start today uh, by looking back to, to where we've been. Uh, I, I told you Buck Run began in 1818 with 21 charter members. Uh, they, they covenanted together uh, in, I think, I believe January 21st of 1818. Uh, they were on what, what was at the time a creek called Buck Run, uh, they, they began there. At the time, they, they only had services once a month. A lot of this we know uh, from a little book written by uh, the man who served as their first pastor, uh, a man named John Taylor. He wrote a book uh, called uh, uh, The History of Churches in Kentucky, Baptist Churches in Kentucky. Uh, he, this, this, he wrote this book. Uh, I think this is the second edition. Uh, this book is from 1827. Uh, so I've made photocopies of it so I don't break this book. Uh, so I can read uh, portions of it to you. Uh, 
Uh, Buck Run began in 1818. They met just once a month uh, for several decades uh, and then began as they could to get other people to come and preach. John Taylor would, would preach those, uh, those first services. Uh, they were there on the forks of, El, uh, of the Elkhorn. Uh, they moved there in the 1840s and they built a small building there uh, and then uh, later uh, in 1888 uh, moved to the, the location of uh, our previous building. Uh, we, of course, moved here in, in 2016. I, I want to read to you quickly. The original covenant, as these 21 members came together in January of 1818 and to form what was the Buckround Baptist Church, uh, this is what they wrote about what they intended to do together, how they covenanted together. This is their church covenant. The church covenant, unanimously agreed on by the church, as we hope a number of us have long since given ourselves to the Lord, we do this day in the divine presence, give ourselves in a church compact to one another. And do solemnly covenant and agree to fulfill the duties of brethren to each other. Not to expose each other's faults, but in the true letter and spirit of the gospel. That we will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But fill out seats both in meetings of business and public worship, except when providentially hindered. That we will watch over each other in brotherly tenderness. Each endeavoring to edify his brother, striving for the benefit of the weak of the flock to raise up the hands that hang down and to strengthen the feeble knees, making straight paths for our feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, that we will hear, that we will bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And as the Lord has prospered us, bear a proportional part of the expense to keep up the worship of God in decency. And in token of our agreement, our above agreement, give each other our hands and hearts. And as it is needful to have some epithet to distinguish our church from one another, the future style of our records shall, be, shall name our church the Baptist Church of Christ on Buck Run. And our monthly meetings to be held the last Sunday in each month with the Lord's Day following, January 31st, 1818. We can still affirm every bit of that church covenant. Uh, I'll just give you a spoiler alert. When we talk about membership expectations, a lot of those things are going to come back. It's the expectation that Buckron has had for its members ever since they first gathered together and covenanted together way back in, in 1818. There's a, a couple more pieces uh, I, I want to read to you from John Taylor's history of Buckron. I think it's useful for us to remember. Here we are. We're in February of 2024, we're praying for the Lord to do work in and through us, praying for the Lord to bless our teaching and preaching and to see people come to faith here. We want people to hear the gospel and believe and be saved. And I think it's really helpful for us to remember God has been doing that at Buck Run in this body since 1818. And a lot of what we get from John Taylor is early history uh, of the work of God in, in, in and through this church. So a, a couple pieces uh, I, I just want to, to quickly point out to you. Uh, right after the, the uh, foundation of Buckron in 1818, there was a small revival that sort of broke out in that community. There were several churches around, so, so uh, there were several uh, churches that benefited from this, this work of the Spirit. Uh, John Taylor writes that at the time of the constitution of Buckron, there was a small revival in the neighborhood and spreading more largely through many parts of Scott County. At the Great Crossings Church, they baptized many. And also at North Forks and Forks of the Elkhorn, two neighboring churches, very much, very near on each side of, the, of Buck Run, and a number were baptized. He tells us they, that they, they built a, a small, uh, it was in that time that they were able to, to first build a small building. And he writes this about a particular uh, situation that happened in the church that God used to bring people to faith. He, he says that there was, he writes, a delicate young lady a daughter of a man named Captain Wilson who lived near the meeting house and had married a young man by the name of James Martin. And about the middle of winter, Miss Martin was, had delivered a child and as many others of old mother Eve's daughters, one month after her delivery, she died. The death of this respectable lady had great effect in the neighborhood. For the, the smoking flax that was among the people before from this circumstance broke out into a flame and strong conviction among numbers became very obvious. Several experiences have been told to the church from the death of Miss Martin, and her husband was one of the number. The sovereign Lord, our God, works by means, as he will, in, in the conversion of sinners, that when he pleases, the death of one shall be the life of another. Miss Martin's religious mother also thought that her daughter, Nancy Martin, went to heaven, though she did not 
She did so not professing her faith in Christ before death. Going into our March monthly meeting of 1826, I passed by a Mr. Hubbles, and hearing his wife had a hope in the Lord, I stopped a while, not knowing that my company would be acceptable, especially to Mr. Hubble, for I had somehow known that he was, had concluded that he was a great lover of sin. But beginning to converse with him first, I soon concluded that I had never met with a more penitent man in all my life. He had lost several nights' sleep, and through distress of soul, on the day before, had received a relief that he knew not what to make of, and himself and his wife had concluded to go to the meeting that day and consult the church on what course they should take. And they both came forward and were received by the church with great joy and a pleasing effect on the whole assembly. Great solemnity attended the crowd the next day at the baptizing as Mr. Hubble and his wife took the lead in the late happy revival at Buck Run. Several other men and their wives were baptized afterwards, as was Wingate and his wife, Price and his wife, Casey and his wife. It's a sweet thing to hear. Over 200 years ago, in this body, God using the death of a young lady in the body to bring many people many people to faith. He, he tells, uh, this is the last one I'll, I'll read to you. He tells the, uh, another story about a man who came to faith who didn't want to go to the church service, but his wife uh, convinced him to go. Which, so some things don't change, right? The, he didn't really want to go. He didn't like the preacher, uh, and so he didn't want to go, but his wife, his wife convinced him to, to go. Uh, he, he says, after hearing who was to preach, he refused, saying, you know I have a bad opinion of that man. I consider him a hypocrite. Uh, you, and you must excuse me, but to accommodate his wife, he went with the design to pay no attention as he disliked the man. But that night, the arrows of God reached his soul that he could not extract till he had found relief in the Lord. This hypocrite in Wingate's esteem was uh, Dr. Bulware, now his dear brother in Christ and father in the gospel. And when Wingate, that was this man's name, when Wingate related his experience to the church, (laughs) if weeping is a childish thing, the crowded house all became children. For the most manly philosophy could not suppress their tears. And poor Wingate himself, under the same tender sensations, said, glory, glory to God, by whose sovereign grace the loftiness of man is brought down into the dust of humility. This conquered sinner was baptized the next day with his wife. And, another of a, and a, num, a number of others by the same man he wants to seem to be a hypocrite. I take the time to read to you those accounts of the work of God at Buckrun. It is good for us to remember that God is not just beginning to work at Buckrun. He has been at work in the life of this church for over 200 years. And so what we're asking is that God would continue to let us be a part of what he is sovereignly doing that he has been saving people, these accounts could be written last year. It's the same things that God has been doing ever since the resurrection of Christ and and all throughout this history uh, with Israel in the Old Testament. God is working to bring people to faith, and so we get to be a part of it. It is the honor of what we have at Buck Run. So I I want you to hear me say, I, I don't stand before you in these next four weeks and to say, all right, everybody, hold on. All right, here, here are all the changes that you've been waiting on. I get asked a lot uh, that uh, in the last couple of years, hey, when Dr. York is gone, well, you know, what big things are you bringing, right? This is, right, we're not bringing the McRib back. Like, this is, this is, <laughs> the things that we're doing, the things that God has been doing at Buck Run are the things we need to keep doing. That there is a steadiness to Buck Run that I have not experienced in any other church I've ever seen in all of my life. God has been working here, and so our prayer is that God would see fit to continue to work here that we would continue to do all the things we know to do, to continue to be faithful to the word. So this is what God has been doing. Uh, some, some quick pieces, uh, just leaving from the time of, of John Taylor. Buck Run did not have their first full-time pastor until 1919. So over 100 years, uh, they went with part-time pastors uh, for a while. Even when they began to meet every week, they had different guys that would come uh, and preach uh, on those Sundays, uh, John Taylor preached, I believe, at Buckrun for about 40 years, uh, once a month, as, as well as uh, other folks. Dr. Bulware, who, who was mentioned uh, by, by Taylor in that account, uh, was one of the guys who preached for them often. Uh, but it wasn't until 1919 when they called Herbert Haywood uh, to be their first full-time pastor just to serve. In its over 200 years history, Buckrun has had 78 pastors. 204 years, 78 pastors. 
an average tenure of two and a half years out of those 78 pastors. Now, if you take Dr. York and Dr. Bob Jackson, they together represent about 40 years of Buck Run's history. So 78 pastors, all adding up to, to, to only two and a half years, but Dr. York and Dr. Bob Jackson make up nearly 40 years of that history. And if you look at the history of Buck Run, the greatest fruitfulness that has come in the life of Buck Run has come in the last 40 years. It's come from pastors who stayed. From Bob Jackson who poured out his life here, from Dr. York who poured out his life here. Uh, I want you to hear me say, I want to be here. I want, my life is here, my family's here, my kids are here. This is the, this is home for us. It's the only church our kids know uh, that, that if the Lord would see fit to leave me here for the rest of my life in ministry, I would be happy with that. That is where fruitfulness comes from, not from 77 guys or 76 guys rotating in every two and a half years, but from two guys giving their life here for 40 years. So my prayer is the Lord would, would leave us here, that, that it's good for us as we begin this new season to stop and to give thanks to the Lord for the things that he has done here. Over the course of 204 years, many, many people have come to faith here. Many we have records of, many more we don't have records of. Many faithful pastors have come and preached the gospel, the last two notwithstanding. We want to continue this. So it's good for us to give thanks to the Lord for what he's done in and through us. I want to move now uh, to, to generally uh, some understanding of what it is that we believe. And we think about who we are, what do we believe, what is it that we want to remain faithful to, that we want to remain steady in, uh, in, in the coming years. Again, it's the same things, all the same things that we're steady in right now. Uh, one of the things we talk about in Discover Buck Run, when we, we talk about what it is that we believe, is that we, we say that we want to have essential, in, in essential beliefs we want unity, in non-essential beliefs we have liberty, but in all of our, our beliefs we show charity. So in the essential things, in, in the, the things that make up what it means to be a, uh, a Christian, at the, the core, we'll, we'll talk through some of these things in a moment, these core beliefs, we want to have unity. I mean, there's, there's no room for us to be divided on who God is. There's no room for us to be divided on the Trinity. There's no room for us to be divided on uh, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. There are uh, essential elements to what it means to be a believer, to what it means to believe the gospel and to believe the word of God and to follow him, that there are essentials, that in those essentials we must be united. And in the non-essentials, we have liberty. Right? So Paul, Paul says in Romans uh, 14, he says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. He says later in, in that same chapter, So then each of us will give an account to God. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. That in the non-essential things, there's liberty. That we're looking for unity, not uniformity. That if, if you're looking for a church where every member of the church will agree about every single item of belief, this is not the church for you. And I think you're going to be looking for a long time. And the only way that will happen is if the church is made up of only you. We don't have to agree on all of the tertiary issues, right, that, that, that there is uh, in these non-essentials. We, we have liberty. We show grace to one another so that in all things, in all of our beliefs, we show charity. Right? That hope believes all things. Or love hopes all things and believes all things. That love wants to believe the best. That we desire to be gracious with one another. Especially in those areas where we might disagree. Right? If there are there's 200 of us in this room right now. If I asked you all to give me your specific timeline for the return of Jesus. If there are 200 of us in here, we're going to get 300 answers. You know, we, right? There are big pieces we must all agree on. We, we all believe that Jesus is coming back for us. We all believe that those who have repented and put their faith and trust in Christ will be saved, that those apart from Christ will not be saved, that they will go to an eternal hell. There are pieces of that we all believe, but how specifically that works out, we might differ on some of the, the specifics there. That's okay. We show grace and love to one another. In the essentials, we're united. In the non-essentials, we show liberty. And in all beliefs, we want to show charity. We want to show love. We want to think the best of others. So I'll have you know that even... In, in other folks or lay folks who teach, whether in, in kids' ministry or student ministry or even in adult Sunday school classes, 
the, for me, as, as one of the pastors, we're not asking Sunday school teachers, all right, I need you to tell me, and I need to make sure that you line up with me on every single opinion that I have in order for you to teach. That this was something that, that I think both Bob Jackson and Dr. York did really well in their tenures, that it was perfectly acceptable for a Sunday school teacher to say, now, pastor sees this passage this way, and I, I get where he's coming from, but you know what, I understand this passage a little bit different, and here's how I see it. But that's, that is... Unity in essentials, liberty in non-essentials, and it is charity in all things. Right? That, that, that we are, uh, want to have a gracious attitude towards one another, even as we hold tight to the essentials. Right? That we're, we want to be united in, in the essential beliefs. So, what are those essential beliefs? Let's begin with well, just a run-through of the gospel. Again, I hope this will not be new to you. We say the gospel, what is it that we, what is it that we mean? We're, we're talking about, first, the character of God. The gospel begins not with man, but the gospel begins with God. The gospel begins answering the question, who is God? God is the holy and just creator of all things. We are each created by God and thus are accountable to God. Isaiah 43, 15, I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. That we are, as human beings, because we are made by God, we are accountable to the just creator of all the universe. Yes, he is merciful, and yes, he is kind, but he is also just. And But because God is holy and cannot be in the presence of sin, God, in his holiness, must deal with sin. That if God were to not deal with sin, if God were to act as if sin did not matter and was of, was of no consequence, then God would no longer be just. God would no longer be holy. We believe in a just and holy God, a God who is kind and merciful and loving, but is just and holy. That is the creator that, that we think the Bible teaches then in light of that, then we can begin to answer the question, well, if that's who God is, who am I? Well, one, I am a creature. I am not the creator. Thus, I am not the captain of my own life. That I am a creature and I am a sinner. That we are each created by God, but we have been corrupted by sin. That we were born in sin. That our hearts are bent towards sin. That we are not born neutral and, and hoping to fall one way or the other. We are born bent towards sin, bent towards hell. And yet God is gracious to us in Christ. Romans 3 says, 3.12 says, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. No, not even one. He says later in the same chapter in 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then in chapter 6.23, Paul says, for the wages of sin is death. God is holy, and he is just, and he is the creator of all, and we are his creatures, and we are sinful before him. God must deal with our sin if he is to be holy and to be just. Therefore, the wages of sin is is death, that we can do nothing in and of ourselves to save ourselves, that we are holy at the mercy of God. So if that's who God is and that's who we are, then we begin to think, how is it that God has saved us? It is only through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that we believe in the sufficiency of Christ for salvation, that Jesus alone is able to remove the penalty of sin, to free us from the power of sin, and to bring us into the family of God. It is only through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus that we are saved. We come to him, and we find salvation. 1 John 3, 5, John writes, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Peter writes, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, the Lord Jesus himself says, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. If you could flip a switch, and guarantee that from this moment until your death, you would never sin again. It would not be enough to make up for your sin. You, you could not tip the scales back in your favor. That all of us are sinners, and thus all of us are worthy of the judgment of God poured out upon us. And there is nothing you can do to save yourself. And God, because not only is he just, but God is merciful, sent his own son, who lived a perfect life, who was perfectly righteous in word and thought and deed through his entire life, being fully God and fully man, who took upon himself on his body, on the tree, our sin, that he bears the iniquity of the unrighteous, that we might be saved. We believe in the sufficiency of Christ for salvation. We are not saying you must come to Christ and do a bunch of other stuff. 
Right? So I want you to hear me clearly, even as we're going to talk about next week, what is expected of members? What, what is it that we do as members of Buck Run? What should we do if we're covenanting together in this body? What we're not saying is you must do these things in order to be saved. I don't save you. It's one of the things I love to say when I meet with folks who, are, who, who come uh, either at the end of a service or they come and meet with us and want to know I, 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 the Lord's doing something in me. I want to trust Christ. Again and again and again, I take them to the gospel. I take them to Romans chapter 10. I take them to the promises in the scriptures and say, if you will repent of your sins and trust Jesus, he will save you. Not because I say so. Not because your parents say so, not because Dr. York says so, not because any man says so, but God promises that he will save you because he says so. It is his promise. Believe in the sufficiency of Christ for salvation. Thus, we believe that that work of Christ demands a response. If God is holy and just and we are sinners and God has made a way for salvation through Christ, we must respond in repentance and faith. We can only be restored to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turning from our sins, that's repentance, and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ with all that we have. This is what it means to be saved. It's to turn from your sin and to trust Christ, to be united to Christ. Paul's favorite phrase in in his New Testament epistles is to say that to be saved is to be in Christ, is to be united to him. This is salvation, that we turn from our sin and we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 57, And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. That salvation comes from being united to Christ by repentance and faith. And we believe that if you are truly united to Christ by repentance and faith, that you will follow Jesus with the help of the Holy Spirit all of your days. We're not preaching easy believism, just come and say a prayer and then you get your name on a list where you get out of hell. That is not the gospel of the New Testament. The gospel of the New Testament is about coming and surrendering all that you have to Jesus and saying, I, I can do nothing on my own. I am a sinner before you, worthy of judgment, and yet you have offered me mercy. And we surrender all that we have to Christ and are united to him to, in, in repentance and faith. This is what Jesus preached, his first public uh, words of his public ministry in Mark chapter 1. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. We talk about the gospel This is what we mean, that we are calling people to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus in light of a holy and just and kind and merciful God, in light of their sin, in light of the work uh, and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're calling people to turn from their sins and to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not calling people to try to be better. If you'll just come, we're not offering self-help. If you just come here, we'll give you 10 tips to to a better marriage. If you just come here, we'll give you seven tips to to get wealthy. We are calling people to repent of their sins and to put, put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can promise them because the Lord promises them that if they'll do that, that the Lord will save them. That all who call upon the Lord will be saved. God himself promises that. This is the call of the gospel. God is holy and just. And we are sinners. And he has made a way of salvation to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, it is incumbent. The New Testament tells us it is a command for every man and every woman to repent of their sins and to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the gospel in Cliff Note version. Let's talk about some major uh, sort of central beliefs that, that I, want you to, I want you to hear me say are not going anywhere. And again, it's just helpful for us to be on the same page. These are, again, the core beliefs that we walk people through. Every time a new member comes into the body, we walk them through these. Here's where we are. We want to be very, very clear about where we are. I want it to be really difficult for someone to join our church and then a year in to be surprised by what we believe. I want it to be very difficult for somebody six months in, a year in, three years in to say, oh, my word, I did not know you guys thought that. We want to be very clear about who we are and what we believe, especially in current culture, especially in just the way that things are changing, even amongst churches uh, that that we would consider or have considered in the past faithful churches. That even as a pastor, receiving somebody 
who's transferring membership here from another church, I am much less certain that even if they come from a sister church, that they will share like faith and order with us than I would have been a decade ago, 20 years ago. Things are very different. And so we want to be very clear on the front end. Here's, here's who we are here. This is what we believe. These are the things that we're standing on, that we, we are not moving from these things. Uh, so let's, let's walk through a few of these first. It's just a very simple statement about our belief in the word of God. We believe the Bible to be God's word to man. And it is perfect, and it is free of any mistakes. The theological word we use there is inerrant. Uh, if we, we go back to, I believe it's, it's listed in here in, in some of the, the, the first writings of, uh, of the church in 1818. It says that the, we believe that the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament, as stated in, in their canonical books, is the uniform doctrine of faith, and that this sacred volume is the only infallible rule for all of our faith, and that this sacred vol- volume is the only infallible rule for all of our faith and practice. They use the word infallible. We, most theologians, theologians today use the word inerrant, uh, mainly because in the middle of the 20th century, uh, there were lots of people who, infer, who affirmed the infallibility of the Bible, meaning the Bible is perfect, uh, who would say, yes, I believe that the Bible is infallible, but then they would begin to change and say, well, it's infallible in the ways that it intends to be infallible. It's infallible for spiritual instruction, but th- there are lots of places that the Bible is wrong. And so theologians had to begin to say, well, when we say the Bible is infallible, here's what we mean. So they began to use the word inerrant, meaning that it is, it is the perfect word of God. We believe that every word of God in the Bible is exactly what God intended by the Holy Spirit for us to have. It truly is. You'll, you hear me say it when we do scripture reading on Sunday mornings in, in, in the worship service, that when we read a wor- the word of God, we're not really merely reading about God. We're not reading the thoughts of men about God. We are reading God's very word written to us. We believe that the Bible is the word of God. And in some sense, everything that we're about to talk about that comes after that, after this, rests fully on that belief that we believe that the Bible is the word of God, that it is the final rule and authority for all of our faith and practice. It means it needs to be at the center of what we preach and teach. It is what you'll hear from Kevin, uh, Pastor Kevin and Pastor Will next week or two weeks from now when they talk to you about what does kids ministry look like, what does student ministry look like. Uh, They only get five minutes, but what you'll hear in those five minutes is that at the center of our ministry to kids, at the center of our ministry to students, is the word of God. We want them to be safe. We want them to have a good time. We want them to develop relationships with each other and other, uh, other adults and believers in their life. But at the center is we're not just babysitting them for a couple hours so you can come to church. That we want to teach them the word of God. It is the most important thing we do. We, we've had before uh, people leave Buck Run and say, Man, I, we, we, we don't want to go there. Y'all do too much Bible stuff in your student ministry. To which I say, well, thank you. <laughs> I, you know, if I, I, we, we are very proud of that. Right? We, we want the Bible to be the center of what we do. So that in what we preach and teach, it is the center of what we do. That you're, you're not going to hear us stand up on a Sunday morning and say, all right, we've got this new book by this new author that we're going to walk through over the next six months. No, when we stand up to preach, what are we going to do? We're going to open up the word of God. We're going to read it. We're going to pray over it. And we're going to ask the Lord to speak to us. We are going to stand on the word and hear me. I hope that you will love me enough as your pastor to hold me accountable to this. First church I served in as, as senior pastor the guy that preceded me eventually split the church and for years before he left had departed the faith. Uh, for years before he left had, had began to teach and to preach things that were explicitly contrary to the word of God. And it took forever for, for them to sort of begin to, to uh, bring some things to his attention because they thought, well, he's our pastor. And we feel we uncomfortable bringing these things to his attention. I mean, he, he, the Lord gave him to us. He's our pastor. And so uh, we just sort of have to put up with it. And, and eventually it got so bad that eventually it began to bring some things to his attention. Say, we think you're teaching things that are contrary to the scriptures. And eventually he left and, and split the church. Listen, I need, you to, I need you to hear me say this. I hope that you will love me enough that if I do not preach the scriptures that you will fire me. If I do not preach the word of God, Not only do you have the right to remove me as your pastor, you have the obligation to. 
If you do not, we will not see God do what he has done over the last 204 years. You have not only the right, but you have the obligation to expect that whoever stands in the pulpit will open up the word of God and will teach and preach the word of God to you. It must be at the center of what we do. The word, everything, stands and falls on the word of God. If we want to remain faithful and steadfast, we have to believe that the word of God is the word of God. We have to trust it. We have to to use it as our final authority in all faith and practice. And it must be at the center of everything that we do. It must be the word of God. You must hold me and all the other pastors accountable to that. All right, so everybody, you're agreeing here. You you, You can keep handing the kids, but you will fire me if I do not preach the word of God and I refuse to be corrected. I hope you'll love me enough to do that. First, we believe the Bible is the word of God. Second, we believe that there is one true God. There is one God. There are not many gods. There is not a Christian God and a a Muslim God and a, a Jewish God or a Buddhist God. There is one true God, and that God exists in three persons. He is the creator of all things, and he is the redeemer of mankind, and he exists as God the Father, God the Son, and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Spirit. We believe in the doctrine of the Trinity because the Bible teaches us the doctrine of the Trinity, that there is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And salvation is the work of that one God in three persons. Salvation is not the work of the Lord Jesus Christ with the help of the Spirit saving us from the Father who would like to crush us. Salvation is the plan of the Father and the work of the Son and the empowering of the Spirit all coming together for the salvation of God's people. All of God is at work in all of salvation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that this is the God of the Bible and he is the only true God. We didn't pick one God out of many good options and say, well, this is the one that we'll follow. We believe that there is one God. All other gods are false gods and idols. There is one God and he is the God of the Bible. Number three, we believe that God has created man as male and female. and Man fell into sin by his own will and is completely dependent on God for life and salvation. A few things we will say there. One, it was not controversial in 1818 uh, for the saints at Buck Run to affirm that God created man male and female. Uh, it is a much more touchy subject in 2024 to affirm that God has created man uh, human beings as, <clears throat> as male and female. That what this means, in, at least in a few ways, is one, that we affirm that gender is good. God made us male and female. He has designed us in a particular way that men are different than women and women are different than men. They are both image bearers. They're both made in the image of God. They're, they're equal in dignity and worth. But that gender is good. Gender is not a social construct that we made up to suppress women or to suppress men. Right? That, that we believe that gender is good. God made us. The creation account in Genesis 1 and 2 tells us he made man in his image. He made them male and he made them female. Gender is good. And we are unapologetically complementarian, meaning that not only do we believe that gender is good, but that God made men and God made women to fit together. That they're gifted differently. They have different callings. They serve different roles in the home and in in the church. And God has made them that they might work together for his glory. That the the picture we're told in the Gospels, or in Paul's writing rather, that marriage is a picture of the Gospel. That this relationship between a husband and his wife is a picture of the relationship of Christ and his church. We believe that men are men and women. It's good to be a man and it's good to be a woman. And it's good that God has made us distinctly men and distinctly women. And we believe that those uh, those distinctions are for the good of the church. That we they complement one another. Again, uh, it's, it is increasingly uh, controversial to say that we think men and women are not the same, uh, and we think that's good. Uh, we're going to hold that because we think that's what the Bible says. Uh, this is what uh, the Christian Church has held the entirety of the history of the Christian Church. You you do not find any early church fathers arguing about what it means to be a man uh, in the second century. Uh, they affirmed what the Bible has taught, uh, the, what, what the Israelites have affirmed uh, for the 4,000 years leading into the birth of Christ, that God has made us male and female, and that is good. It is for our good, and it is for the good of the church. So we will affirm, continue to affirm, what we believe to be a biblical sexual ethic. That what do we think about what it means to be a man? What, is it, what do we think about what it means to be a woman? What do we think about the roles of men and women? What do we think about gender and sexuality? That we will take our cues from what we think the Bible teaches. It's the word of God that drives us on these things. So that even if the whole world loses their mind around us, 
we will affirm what the Bible teaches. Now, I want you to hear me say, I, I think the hardest thing coming for the church of the Lord Jesus, particularly in our culture, in the next 20 years, is how to do this in a way that is steadfast in the hope of the gospel and yet is still loving and compassionate. There are a lot of people, I think right now, that are caught up in the mix and mess of the current culture of gender and sexuality and the sort of revolution that's happening there that in five years, 10 years, 15 years are gonna get chewed up and spit out. And when their life is a wreck on the other end of it, who's gonna be there to pick them up? It's gonna have to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to be there with grace and compassion and hope that no matter what mess they have gotten themselves into, that the, the, we, right, we believe the sufficiency of Christ, that the gospel is enough for them. And so we call them to repentance and faith. So I, I think the, the danger is there are going to be churches who begin to bend on what they think, or there are going to be churches who don't bend on what they believe, but are so angry that on those folks who get chewed up and spit out have nowhere to go. We want to do both things. We, we're not bending on what we think the Bible teaches, but we, we hold these things out in grace and hope and mercy and in love that we might receive many people who, who come to faith in Christ, that we might help them. I mean, you, you think no-fault divorce created some messes in families. What's happening now is going to create some really, really tangled webs that we believe that we can help. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's grace and there's mercy and there's hope. So we're believing these things, but we're not angry about it. We're holding out the hope of the gospel that we might see many people come to faith. So we believe God has made us male and female, that we have fallen into sin of our own will. We chose to sin. We wanted sin. It was our desire, and thus we are completely dependent on God for life and salvation. You can do nothing. I can do nothing to save ourselves. It leads us then to the next one. We believe then that salvation is from the Lord and is offered freely to all ma mankind, and it comes only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that salvation is free. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to earn it. There's nothing you could ever do to pay for it, nothing you could ever do to earn it. And thus, because the Lord has offered it to us free, we will offer it freely to all mankind. That we will, as often as the Lord gives us chance, to plead with sinners, as Paul says, to be reconciled to God. To say to all sinners, if you will come to Christ in repentance and faith, you will find mercy and you will find grace. You will find forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. It has been given to us for free. And thus, we will offer it freely to all mankind. We will, in our preaching and our teaching, hold out the gospel to sinners and plead with them to repent and to believe that they might be reconciled to God. We have received freely, thus we give freely, for we believe this is the only way that men will be saved. We're holding out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe then, next item, that salvation includes, number one, repentance, which is turning away from sin, faith, which is belief and trust in Jesus Christ, justification, which is the total pardon of all sin. It is the legal declaration of God that we are, uh, that we are not guilty because of the work of Jesus. We believe in sanctification, which is the certain growth of every Christian in Christ's likeness, that those that God has justified, declared not guilty because of the work of Christ, that he will sanctify us, he will make us holy, and we believe in glorification, which is the end of sanctification, that it, it is the completion of it, which is the final and ultimate perfection of every Christian that comes when we see Jesus. Either we die to go to be with him or, or he comes for us. We believe that every believer who is justified will be sanctified and will ultimately be glorified in the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. That everybody who repents and put their faith in Christ will be declared not guilty by the Lord because of the work of Jesus on their behalf. And he will every day, by the spirit that he has put in them, work to make them more like Jesus until he receives them to himself and then which they will look and be just like Christ. That's what John says. We will see him and we will be as he is. This is the hope of every Christian. We, we are justified, we are sanctified, and we are glorified. We gotta roll. Let's keep going. We believe that the work of salvation is all of God's work and none of man's. What we mean by that is this, that when I get to heaven, God will not say to me, Man, we did pretty good, didn't we? That when I get to heaven, Jesus will not share any of the glory with me for my salvation. That I will be, for all eternity, a trophy of the grace of God. I and Jesus together did not save me. You and Jesus did not get together and save you. We believe that salvation is, a, is God's work and none of man's. 
If it were up to us, we would be lost and dead in our sins. There is nothing that we could do to save ourselves. God, in mercy, had to move towards us in grace. He had to send his son. He had to call us by his spirit. That it is a work of fully of God's and not of man's. And even there are, there are ways of thinking through this that, that I know that even believers in this church differ on some of the, the details of how uh, salvation works and, and, and how the, the providence of God works out in all these things. What I want you to know is even those folks that might differ uh, some on the back end of how does salvation work, I think we can all affirm that it's God's work and not ours. This is me and Jesus didn't get together and save me. It's the work and the grace of the Lord Jesus that salvation is by grace alone. It is unearned and it comes to us only through the work of God. Next, we believe that the church is the body of Christ. We're not just a collection of people who like to come together, but it is the body of Christ and is expressed as an autonomous local congregation. The Buck Run belongs to Buck Run. That though we might partner with other places, we might be in cooperation with uh, local associations or statewide associations or national associations, that we are autonomous. That, That we decide what we believe. We decide what we do. We decide who we call as pastors. We decide what happens at Buck Run, that we are autonomous. And we believe that these local autonomous churches are all over the world and all throughout time. These churches are pastored by qualified men and yet are served in the body by both men and women. This flows from what we believe the Bible teaches the fact that we're made differently. Men and women are made differently. We're given different roles. We think the Bible is clear that, that men are uniquely called to pastor the church. Now, Hear me say, that doesn't mean that all men are called to pastor churches. Especially in the last couple years, I've heard people say, well, if if you hold that only men can be pastors, then you are sidelining 50% of the people in the church. To which I would say, no, if if you want to call not being a pastor sidelining, no, really, we're sidelining like 98% of the people in the church because 98% of people in church won't serve as pastors. We're not saying all men should serve as pastors. We're saying qualified, God-called men will serve as pastors in the body. And we have those instructions, which we'll look at uh, some even later in the year in First and Second Timothy, what God calls pastors. We believe the church is led by qualified men to serve in the office of pastor, but that God gifts every believer in the body, male and female, to serve the body. It's not that only men serve or that only women serve, that both men and women serve in the body. Next, we believe that all Christians observe two ordinances of the church, which are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is the immersion of believers in water, signifying their union with Christ and the church. We're going to see that happen today. Sir, we're reminded, baptism is the outward sign of an inward reality. It is outwardly showing what has already happened in us. Right? It is the immersion of believers in water, signifying the union, their union with Christ and the church. And the Lord's Supper is the remembrance of the death of Jesus Christ and our accountability to our obedience to him, that we would walk in holiness. We believe these things are symbols. And if we've failed one thing often, I think, as Baptists, is that we have said of the ordinances, uh, we're so afraid of being Catholic, that we have said of the ordinances, well, they're just symbols, right? They're just, they're just symbols. They're not sacraments. They don't bestow any particular grace on us. They're, they're just symbols, to which we would say, well, that's true. They're symbols, but they're very important symbols that God himself has commanded to us. And so, yes, they're symbols, I, it, yeah, when I, we, we talk with kids about baptism, one of the things I always like to say to them is like, do you know where we get our water for the baptistry? And I was like, where? Frankfurt Plant Board. <laughs> it's just, it's the same water at your house. It's not, it's not magic water. There's nothing, right, that, that if you get in here and you get wet and you have not trusted Christ, this water means nothing, right? It's a symbol. It's a picture. This water can't save you. If you have not trusted Christ, you could take communion every day of your life, and it will mean nothing to you. In fact, not only will it bring no positive effect to you, Paul says you better watch out. If you're taking the Lord's Supper without having trusted Christ, it's a dangerous thing. So they are symbols, but they're very important symbols that God himself has given to us. And so we hold them up as the two ordinances of the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. We believe next, the first day of the week is the Lord's Day, in which Christians worship both publicly and privately. And I don't, I don't believe that we're, we don't believe that we're under the Sabbath in the same way that the, the Old Testament Israelites were under the Sabbath. But we do believe in setting aside a day to worship the Lord, both publicly and privately. We, we believe in coming together as the body of Christ. One of the things you'll you hear me say next week, the very first thing that is listed uh, in our expectation of, of members that we talk about all the time, that is in, the, in what they, they 
covenanted together in 1818 is that we covenant together to not forsake the assembling together. Part of what it means to be together and what it means to believe that we are to set aside time in the week to worship is that we do that together as a body. There is not a New Testament category for being a member of a church which you do not attend. Right, we're not, I'm not talking about you get sick, you're providentially hindered, or you're shut in. Right? There, are, right, there might be providentially hindered, right, is even the phrase that they use. There might be things that keep you from coming. There is no New Testament category for being a member of a church of which you could attend but choose not to. You know, part of this is we, we set aside time to be together, to come together as the body. When we go a million different directions during the week. We come back together to worship, to hear the gospel preached, to hear the word preached. Uh, that we might be reminded of who we are. We might be strengthened. We might strengthen one another. We might care for one another and serve one another that we set aside this time each week to be together, to worship both publicly and privately. And lastly, we believe that God, in his own time and way, will bring the world to a right end and that Jesus Christ will physically return to the earth at that time and the world will be judged and all Christians will be brought to live together with the Lord in heaven forever. Simply, we believe Jesus is coming back for us. That the return of Christ is not merely a hope or a dream that we fool ourselves with so that we can make it through the day. That we believe that what the Bible teaches, that the return of Jesus is real and it is going to happen. And uh, the last prayer of the New Testament that we're taught to pray is this, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We're we're, we're desiring, right? This is, Dr. York told you this last week. This might be my last sermon today if uh, Dr. York has his way and his prayers are answered. He's praying for the Lord to give me one sermon and the Lord come back. We're praying for the return of Jesus, that he would come. We believe that the return is real, and we are looking forward to it. What I want you to hear from me in this, again, what we've done today is just the 100,000-foot view over some of these doctrines. What I want you to hear me say is we are not innovators. We We don't... get here on Monday morning and think, man, what new doctrines could we come up with this week? Let's, let's figure out some new stuff. No, we are not innovators. We are stewards. It says something that we can affirm the same statement of faith that these 21 members affirmed in 1818. It's because we're not innovators. We're not making up new things. We're not coming up with new doctrines. We are stewards of the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And if we want, if the Lord tarries, if we want people to, to be here in 200 years thinking about what God has done in and through us in this generation, we must be steadfast. We must be good stewards of what God has given us, that we would hold tight to the gospel, that we would preach the word of God, and we would make it the center of all that we say and do. Uh, Let me pray for us, and and we'll be done. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for the work that you have done in and through Buck Run for the last 204 years. And Father, we pray that you would make us faithful. That you would give us everything we need. That you would provide wisdom and discernment by your spirit. That you would strengthen us by your spirit. That you would use your word to instruct us. Father, we pray that you would enable us in all that we do to preach and to teach the word. And Father, we pray that as we put the word at the center, that you would use that word to draw men and women to yourself, that they would see the glory of a crucified and risen Savior, that they would see the mercy that is shown to them in the cross, and that they would run to the Lord Jesus in repentance and faith. Father, we pray that as we enter into a new season, that you would bring the fruit of the gospel. Sanctify us, grow us, make us more like Christ. And use us to proclaim the gospel that your name may be glorified. Father, we pray that if if, if we are here still in 200 years, that we would be here only for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That his name would be lifted high. Father, we pray even as we go to service today that you would be with us. In every prayer and in every song and every scripture read, Father, we pray that your name would be glorified. And that we might be united together in your name. We pray all this in the gracious name of your Son. Amen.